All right, class, let's all settle down for a second. Who's feeling brave enough to go first with their presentation on famous scientists? How about you, Timmy? You're looking like you're ready to drop some knowledge on us. Yeah, sure. So Carl Linnaeus was born in Sweden in 1707. And from the start, it was pretty clear this dude was not going to be your typical Swedish kid. While most kids were out doing normal things like, I don't know, learning to fish or just being kids, little Carl was more interested in figuring out why plants were different from each other. His dad, a minister who was also into plants, nerd genes confirmed, had a garden that was like Carl's playground. Forget sandcastles, young Carl was all about those botanical life goals. Fast forward a few years, and Carl's in university trying to become a doctor. But surprise, surprise, while studying medicine, he's still laser focused on plants. Honestly, you'd think the guy was in a relationship with them, so he ends up attending both the University of Lund and Uppsala University, but let's be real, he was just looking for more plants to obsess over. If there was a plant anywhere within walking distance, Carl was on it like a, a kid on candy. By the time he was in his 20s, Linnaeus was already thinking, why is nature so messy? Let's get organized. And that's when he cooked up his big plan, his magnum opus, the Systema Naturae. Basically, he looked at the chaos of the natural world and said, you know what, I'm going to sort this out. So... He created this whole classification system that would make even the most obsessive compulsive person feel inadequate and um, everything was neatly placed into cat categories like kingdoms, classes, orders, genera and species. Uh, think of it like a nature themed version of Marie Kondo's Park Joy method except Carl made sure everything had a Latin name before it could join the party. Uh, the first version of Sistema Naturae was kind of like a pamphlet, it had just a few pages. But Carl was just getting started and uh, he wasn't going to let nature off that easy. So. Over the years, he kept expanding the book like it was the ultimate collector's edition, adding more and more species. By the time he was done, the book had grown into a monster of knowledge with thousands of species all neatly categorized. If nature had a library, Linnaeus was its chief librarian. Now, if you've ever been forced to learn the scientific names of animals or plants, thanks biology class, you've got Carl Linnaeus to thank or blame, depending on how much you like memorizing Latin. Linnaeus invented the system of binomial nomenclature, which is just a fancy way of saying that every species gets a two-part name. It's like first and last names, but for living things. Instead of saying that big cat with a mane, um, you call it Panthera Leo and feel like a genius for knowing the Latin. It's kind of like giving every living thing an official name tag at some global science convention. Before Linnaeus came along, naming species was chaos. Scientists would call the same species by different names, and some names were ridiculously long, like full-on descriptive sentences in Latin. Linnaeus looked at that mess and said, we need to fix this, and bam, he simplified it down to two names, genus and species. Easy, right? Well, easier than before, but let's be real, it still meant a lot of people had to learn Latin, which was probably his secret way of getting back at the world for not appreciating plants as much as he did in by the time Linnaeus got a taste of fame, he was basically the Leonardo DiCaprio of taxonomy. He ended up getting all kinds of accolades, including being knighted by the Swedish king and being elected to prestigious societies like the Royal Society in London. But he didn't stop there. He started teaching at the University of Uppsala, where he recruited a bunch of eager students and turned them into his own personal army of plant and animal collectors. Linnaeus's students were like his science minions, running around the world collecting specimens from far off places. These students would bring back exotic plants and animals and Carl would happily slap a Latin name on them and add them to his ever-growing catalog. Imagine being a student of Linnaeus, knowing that your future involved traveling to places you'd never heard of, or to bring back a weird looking plant for your professor to name. Fun, right? Well, unless you are the unlucky one who got sent to some mosquito-infested jungle. But hey, all in the name of science. Linnaeus didn't just leave behind a bunch of old books and dried up plant specimens. He left behind a legacy that still messes with students' heads today. His system of naming and classifying species became the foundation for modern taxonomy, and scientists still use it to this day. That means every time you're stuck trying to remember if Homo sapiens is the scientific name for humans, or 
if Canis Lupus means wolf. It does. So Carl Linnaeus wasn't just some random old guy who liked plants. He was the original nature nerd, the kind of guy who'd spend his Friday nights categorizing species instead of going out. He took his love for order and turned it into a system that scientists still use today. Sure, he made life harder for anyone who had to learn those Latin names, but in the end, he made it possible for scientists around the world to talk about living things in a universal language. Okay, Timmy, that's enough for today. All right, class, settle down. Today's the big day. Timmy's back with another presentation. Last time, he presented us Carl Linnaeus, and now, by popular demand, he's diving into the life of Charles Darwin. Timmy, the floor is yours. Great, so as you requested, let's talk about Charles Darwin, the guy who blew everyone's minds by saying, hey, what if we didn't just pop into existence as is? Born in 1809, Darwin was your classic curious kid, poking around in nature and probably asking way too many questions. So here's the deal. Darwin wasn't exactly cut out for the family plan. His dad wanted him to be a doctor, but med school was a total snooze fest for Darwin. He bailed on that real quick because, honestly, watching surgeries was not his vibe. Next up, the family pushed him towards becoming a clergyman. Yeah, because nothing says wild explorer like a quiet life in the church, right? But Darwin had other ideas like, how about I travel the world instead? Then came the offer that changed everything. The HMS Beagle, a ship about to set sail on a five-year voyage around the world. Darwin was like, Sign me up! Uh, he hopped on board, and boom, his life was forever changed. While the crew was probably just trying to survive seasickness, Darwin was out there collecting plants, animals, and rocks, thinking, this is way better than med school. After spending five years on the Beagle, Darwin came back with more than just seashells and a tan. He had a head full of ideas, big ones. He started piecing together a theory that was going to blow everyone's minds, but instead of shouting it from the rooftops, Darwin played it cool and sat it on his theory for over 20 years. Why? Probably because he knew this was going to shake things up like an earthquake. But then in walks Alfred Russell Wallace, another naturalist who'd been traveling and thinking along the same lines as Darwin. When Wallace sent Darwin his own ideas about evolution, Darwin had one of those oh crap moments. Realizing he wasn't the only one onto something big, Darwin finally decided to drop the mic with On the Origin of Species in 1859. The book hit like a bombshell, making everyone either freak out or high-five him. His main idea? Evolution by natural selection. In simple terms, it's like nature's way of saying, only the strong survive. Species evolve over time, adapting to their environment, and the ones that don't, well, let's just say they don't make it to the next round. It was like Darwin handed out a reality check to everyone who thought life was all about divine creation. Now, while Darwin was busy rewriting the rules of life, he was also juggling life as a family man. Believe it or not, Darwin and his wife, Emma, had 10 kids. Yeah, 10. Imagine coming home from a long day of pondering the mysteries of the universe to a house full of kids. Darwin didn't just stir the pot, he turned the whole kitchen upside down. Once his theory was out there, there was no going back. Scientists, philosophers, and even regular folks started debating it like it was the hottest gossip in town. Some loved it, some hated it, but everyone was talking about it. Like, Darwin had kicked off an evolution revolution, and the world of science would never be the same. Even though Darwin himself was a bit of a recluse in his later years, his ideas spread like wildfire. So Charles Darwin wasn't just some bearded old dude with a lot of time on his hands. He was the guy who took a wild idea, backed it up with evidence, and dropped it on the world like a bombshell. If Linnaeus was the original biology nerd, Darwin was the rock star who made biology the coolest, most controversial subject around. Okay, Timmy, that's enough for today. All right, class, I hope you're ready because Timmy is back with another killer presentation. Last time, we dove into the world of Charles Darwin, and today, by popular demand, we're turning our attention to the guy who pretty much invented genetics. Yes, so let's talk about Gregor Mendel, the guy who basically cracked the code on how traits get passed down from one generation to the next. Born in 1822 in what's now the Czech Republic, Mendel wasn't your typical scientist. He was actually a monk 
Yeah, you heard that right. While most monks were busy praying or copying manuscripts, Mendel was out there breeding pea plants. So Mendel grew up in a farming family, which might explain why he was so into plants. From a young age, he had a knack for gardening and an insatiable curiosity about how the natural world worked. <laughs> but life wasn't exactly a walk in the park for young Gregor. Despite being a bright student, his family was pretty strapped for cash, which made pursuing higher education a challenge. But Mendel wasn't about to let a little thing like money get in the way of his dreams. After struggling to make ends meet while attending the University of Vienna, Mendel decided to join the Augustinian Monastery in Brno. It wasn't just about finding a place to live, it was about finding a place where he could keep learning. The monastery was a hotspot for education, with a library packed with scientific books and gardens ripe for experimentation. Mendel's scientific journey had just begun, even if it didn't exactly start the way he'd planned. Now, instead of just chilling in the monastery, Mendel decided to get serious about his plant experiments. And our uh, picture this. A serene monastery garden, monks chanting in the background, and there's Mendel, surrounded by rows of pea plants, deep in thought. While the other monks might have been focused on spiritual matters, Mendel was laser-focused on something a bit more earthly, peas. But these weren't just any peas. Mendel chose pea plants because they, they had distinct, easy-to-track traits like flower, color, and seed shape. Plus, they were quick to grow and didn't require much space. Perfect for his monastery garden. Mendel started cross-breeding the plants, carefully controlling pollination with a tiny brush. Like some kind of green-thumbed mad scientist, he was basically running a pea plant dating service, making sure each one had the right partner to see what would happen to their offspring. Over the course of about seven years, Mendel bred and analyzed around 28,000 pea plants. Yeah, you heard that right, and 28,000. Talk about dedication. Through these experiments, Mendel noticed something strange. Certain traits would appear in predictable ratios in the next generation. He wasn't just growing peas, he was discovering the fundamental principles of heredity. Mendel figured out that traits are passed down in units, which we now call genes, and these genes come in pairs, one from each parent, through thousands of experiments and probably more pea soup than anyone should ever eat. Mendel came up with the ideas we now know as Mendel's Laws of Inheritance. These include the Law of Segregation and the Law of Independent Assortment. So Mendel oh, publishes his yeah. findings in 1866 and the world was like crickets. No one really paid attention. Mendel's groundbreaking <laughs> work was published in a pretty obscure <laughs> journal and it didn't exactly set the scientific world on fire. Mendel spent the rest of his life as a monk eventually becoming abbot of his monastery, and probably thought his work was going to fade into obscurity. Little did he know his pea plants would become the stuff of legend. It wasn't until the early 1900s, about 30 years after his death, that scientists rediscovered Mendel's work. It was like finding an old forgotten treasure chest full of gold. Suddenly everyone realized, whoa, this guy just figured out how inheritance works. Besides his obsession with peas, Mendel was also into beekeeping. He even tried crossbreeding bees to see if he could create a new strain. Unfortunately, it didn't go as well as the peas. His bees were super aggressive and didn't produce much honey. Even though Mendel didn't get to see his theories become the foundation of modern genetics today, he's known as the father of genetics. His pea plant experiments are legendary and his ideas laid the groundwork for everything from understanding hereditary diseases to genetic engineering. Wow, Timmy! That was awesome. Mendel may have been overlooked in his time, but you've definitely made sure we all know how important his work was. Great job. Now class, start thinking about who you want Timmy to cover next. Till next time.